everybody, Gwine here, and I am joined by one of our longtime members, Jeremy Diamond from Myzeum. Hey, good to be here. <laughs> and we are starting something new. So in this time of uncertainty and things that are um, a little bit unusual for a lot of us as leaders, Jeremy, Jeremy and I thought we'd jump on a call and uh, just talk about what's working and what are we learning as leaders as we're navigating through this very unusual time that we're all kind of living through. And my daughter said to me the other day, she said, well, you know, it's an experienced mom living through a pandemic. I'm going to be able to say that for the rest of my life. Um, so we're going to do this, I think, on a regular basis. Jeremy reached out to say, hey, I've got some thoughts do you want to get on a call and do it and i think this will be a great thing for our community so if you're interested in jumping on a call with me to share what's uh happening in your world reach out and let us know we'd love to talk to you so without further ado let's get into it so jeremy before we jump into some of the questions that um i sent over to you why don't you tell us a little bit about uh myzeum and your team and so we've got a bit of context in terms of what we're looking at Sure. I mean, it's great, great to chat with you as always. And I think we are living through a little bit of uh, uncertainty and quite a bit of uncertainty in people's lives, personally, professionally. But I think there's opportunities to see as organizations how we can pivot, how we can be responsive and nimble in, in times like this and really set ourselves up for maybe some success that we can have down the road. This is an opportunity, I think, for organizations to um, maybe question the way that they do things as the normal. And uh, there will be a new normal and a new reality coming out of this. And I think organizations that will do well and be successful and, uh, and teams that will be successful will be ones that can come out of this um, uh, in a really good place. So, you know, Myzeme of Toronto is a, a small not-for-profit. We're about nine people. Uh, we would refer to ourselves as Toronto's Museum Without Walls. The idea that the city is your museum and the, the non-traditional approach of uh, storytelling comes from partnership with cultural organizations or community groups or neighborhoods, artists, performers that we work with facilitate the storytelling of some of those untold and underrepresented stories of the city. Things that people may not know about the city that they work in, walk in, do all those things with their, uh, uh, with their communities on an everyday basis. So we're non-traditional in the way that we don't have a building, we don't have a collection, we don't rely on admissions or a gift shop. We're out in the city. So our programming looks a little bit different throughout the 12 months of the year. So um, when something like this has come along, we've really had to look at our digital output and how we've been able to really try and pivot to continue telling stories, putting out some great content, but maybe being careful to not overdo it with our audience at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I love the concept of Myzeum. I think it's just genius. And um, I think that in many ways, you're ahead of the curve on, on something like uh, this that a lot of us are facing. So there's a lot of companies that are having to pivot really, really quickly. For you, you know, not relying on bricks and mortar, as you say, in a gift shop, um, probably has been a bit of an advantage. What would you say in terms of, um, you know, positive things that are coming out of this uh, experience for your team, your organization at this time? Like, are there things that you're uh, seeing are um, actually leading to some new things or new innovations or ideas for you guys? Yeah, I think new new ideas and innovations. I think this is a, a perfect time, at least for our organization, to uh, you know to develop those and investigate how we mm. do that. One thing is, you know, we have events called um, Myzeum Connects which is really what, what it sounds like. It's connecting people, it's sort of a networking opportunity for, uh, for folks in the city that may be in the arts, may be in, um, uh, in archives, in, in any sort of other areas in the city that are telling, you know, telling the stories of Toronto. So we usually hold those events at a site in real life somewhere in the city three, two or three times a year. We'll get 100, 10, 25, 150 people at those. We're pivoting to do digital connects events uh, starting in a couple of weeks, and we're going to try and do two, three, or four of them. We're going to get a lot more people than 125 because obviously people can join a lot easier, right. um, uh, you know, digitally. And thinking about geographically, we're going to be speaking to people through that forum that are outside of the Toronto borders. Mm -hmm. and, 
that's a great opportunity for us for a branding perspective, um, to talk about themes and um, have a dialogue and a conversation about, you know, issues that we're all dealing with in the arts and culture sector, regardless of whether you're in Europe, you're in the US, you're in Canada, you're in downtown Toronto. So uh, it positions us really well to be a thought leader around these issues yeah. uh, and not just have a panel discussion and talk, but also see what kind of um, input we can get from those that are joining the conversation. You know, a perspective of somebody at a local museum in the U.S. or a, um, some sort of historic site or institution or arts and culture um, uh, institution or organization in Europe can really bring a lot to the conversation. And if we're there facilitating that and learning from each other that way and doing it in an hour, hour and a half online, a uh, great opportunity for us, um, you know, to uh, to lead that. And also maybe there's a way that we can all pick up some tips about how to uh, more effectively run our organizations post COVID. Yeah, I think, I think what um, you're touching on is so great. Cause I think that, I think that right now we were talking about this the other day in one of our other groups that, you know, the, the classic William Bridges change curve, you know, we, we've had the big shock and the, you know, denial and, uh, you know, uh, negotiating and all the things that happened when the, the change happened around COVID. I know I was at that early stage going, wow, well, no, it's not going to be that bad. And then all of a sudden you kind of get into it. And, you know, we're all kind of in this transition zone right now that Bridges would call it. And that, you know, there's a few things that ha can happen in there. But one of the big opportunities is the opportunity for innovation. And I, I do think a lot of it is how you choose to view it as a leader. Like you can look at it through the lens of, oh, my gosh, everything's changing and this is negative and go down the path of the negative impacts. Or you can really look at it to, to see what the opportunities are and the possibilities that this is opening up. And I do think what we're seeing more and more with people getting more comfortable with this kind of technology is the opportunity to create communities, um, like you're talking about with other colleagues around the world. And how do you, I mean, you know, because you're part of the roundtable community, like the extraction of sharing ideas when you're with peers and colleagues um, can exponentially allow you to grow your business. Our, our mandate and our structure of our organization is all partnership driven. So we are not an organization that waits for the public to, to come to us, or we wait to say to the public, wait till our next story is out there. We work with people. We yeah. are working with different neighbors and communities and different uh, uh, folks in the arts and culture sector. So just by, just by that construct, partnership is, is an obvious uh, um, opportunity here while we're all sort of sitting on on uh, our phones and computers and can't uh, uh, can't experience these things in, in real life so um, but what this also allows us to do is take that partnership model and say wow we've created a lot of great partnerships we are going to be able to create so many more maybe people that never thought uh, that they would come to a museum event virtually people that have not heard of us in the past people that have been working on and running and developing and creating some amazing projects. And now they see us and say, you know what, that would be great. You guys run a festival every year that talks about the intersectionality of telling stories around the, uh, from the city from all different types of perspectives. And I didn't realize that. Let's talk in a couple of months because we're putting something interesting together. Maybe we can enter your festival. So yeah. it is a win-win in, in many ways while we're struggling with all the other obvious parts of, uh, uh, of these challenging times. But I think if we're going to be able to weather it and be able to really think of where our opportunities are going to be, we not only have to think about what our six to eight week output looks like, but what kind of organization and leaders we want to become six, eight months from now. Uh, yeah. And that's a bit harder to do. And, and I do think, I, I think the other thing too, that you really make me think of, and I was having this conversation with a colleague um, the other day too, is that, you know, I think the future of business is going to be about partnerships and joint ventures. And I do think that's something that in the not-for-profit space, um, you know, there has always been a much more collaborative spirit having worked in that space myself. I have always, because you kind of have to, because your limit, your resources are so limited. Um, but I don't think it's been the mindset for a lot of, uh, you know, for-profit organizations. It's always been about acquire as opposed to partner. And, um, you know, there's a great opportunity now to 
for all of us to really be flexing these collaboration muscles, which kind of leads me to the, my next question, which is really to get into the zone of leadership, which is, you know, the, the space we play. Um, as you've been kind of navigating your team through this um, kind of time where it was all upended, I remember we saw each other actually right before the uh, yeah. proverbial crap hit the fan, yeah, yeah. Um, literally, I think two days before everything really went yeah. south. And, um, you know, the, the idea of, you know, with our teams kind of helping them get through it, what have you had to kind of do? How, how have you sort of adapted your leadership approach? Is there anything that you're finding you're having to do more of or, or back away from as a leader? Um, just kind of getting your team through this. Yeah, I mean, we, we're nine people in about 700 square feet uh, most of the time. Sometimes we have a couple interns there, call it 10 or 11 people on any given day. Now we are by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so the transition for some people working remotely is something that they're either used to or they've done in different positions. Um, but others, this is completely new. They count on the social interaction and the collaboration of face-to-face um, interaction in the in the office to you know uh, further their um, you know enjoyment and satisfaction of their workday and uh, that's been taken away uh, in a way and so I think that what I've been trying to do is not only check in uh, with everybody on my team um, but also just see where the comfort level is there some people's workstations from their office or a small apartment or a farm or wherever they are, they're all gonna be a little bit different. So I don't think we have to be very careful about making assumptions that, hey, they're working at home and they're in a t-shirt and, and shorts and they're just putting on their computer and doing their work. It's not natural for everybody. So right from the beginning, our communication was very strong, uh, having conversations with everybody on the team uh, what does that workspace look like? What kind of support do you need? Um, uh, we have regular check-ins with small teams and the whole team. Uh, we even had a great thing a couple of days ago where we decided everybody's got to wear their, their craziest hat. And so we had 10 people on the screen all wearing hats of, that had different stories behind them and then sort of talk a little bit about that. But everybody kind of let their guard down a bit. And I think it was a way to still um, sustain that great camaraderie that we have as a small team, even though you look around and you're the only one in that room. Um, so I think there's a business and a professional and uh, maybe the strict kind of what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing? Where can I help? How can I support? But then there's also the lighter side of things too and say, guys, we're all experiencing this together. It's not ideal, um, but I think we can have fun with it. The way that we have fun in the office uh, on any regular day, that shouldn't change, but we can maybe be a little bit more creative with things like Zoom backgrounds or hats, or mm -hmm. I know later today we're gonna have a trivia game as, as part of our whole team for a Friday afternoon. So there is opportunities there, and, um, and I think the longer this goes, I think people feel, uh, and I know people are feeling a bit more comfortable in the, again, the new reality in that space that they're working in. And even you could, you could argue or, or have a discussion about the challenges of what it's gonna be like when we go back to an office, whenever that may be. Mm -hmm. The transition of working outside an office, once you figure that out, to reinsert to uh, what was the, uh, the old normal, um, we're gonna to have to be mindful of whether that is even a construct that, we want to continue with. Maybe it's a day or two working from home because we found that we're very um, collaborative and uh, uh, and uh, you know accomplished some great things when we're we're out of the office. So we're mindful of all those things, and uh, I think we're we're learning day by day and, and on the go here. Yeah, and I I think you know what did they say? Say twelve weeks to change a new behavior. So mm -hmm. if we're going to be in this for twelve weeks, which a lot of people are seeing that that's probably where we're going to be right. at. Um, it, I think it is going to instill some new ways of working, some new ways of thinking and some new habits with people that, you know, that we might, are, we're not going to want to go back to how it was before and we're going to want to create some more flexibility. And I'm hearing from uh, a number of our bigger uh, clients. I was just on a call actually with some colleagues in the U S and they were saying that a lot of uh, the companies that they've been talking to and working with are really questioning whether or not, you know, how much bricks and mortar they need, yeah. um, you know, whether or not they need to look at things. Because I do think there's been a lot of resistance. I know you and I are of a generation that probably don't have the same degree of resistance towards working from home. But yeah. I think there's been a lot of uh, 
leaders, I would say, that have been highly skeptical about productivity and working from home and, um, you know, are, are starting to see the light on that, which is great for, I think, you know, just workplaces generally. But what's, have you had any sort of big ahas or big learnings as a leader through this process, things that have maybe surprised you a little bit? Um, I am a bit surprised on how well uh, much of my team has has pivoted or, or uh, transformed into a, you know effective um, team members uh, from from home. I think that we are a team that again is small in a small space. There's a lot of hey, let's three people meet over by the table and right. let's grab that person and then let's pivot our chair and say hey, what about this idea? That's much more difficult to do. It has a little bit more effort that it takes to do that <laughs> if you're on a Zoom call I and mean, you turn around and that's your wall. You actually have to invite somebody to that conversation where normally you don't have to do that. So, yeah. but I've found that uh, people have fallen into this new normal uh, in a very effective and, and positive way because I think that they're being supported by everybody around them. And leadership, I think, is, as we all know, is, is not a one-way street. We take leadership tips from people that, you know, that are my reports and people that report to my reports and see how people are doing things well, what challenges they're having. Uh, and then I'm inserting myself where, when, where and when I think it makes sense. And, um, but I also don't think it should just be, a, hey, I'm meeting with my team and then me as CEO, I'm gonna meet with my team, but then I don't meet with the other teams that are meeting with their respective teams. It needs to be, a, uh, let's have a one-on-one -on -one about something that is work-related and let's talk about sports and music for a bit, right? We did a thing on our Zoom call, what music are you listening to? What show are you watching? what podcasts have you just downloaded yeah. right and then having those conversations separately with people as well and uh, there is a great opportunity here to make people feel a bit more comfortable in this new normal and I'm really seeing I mean really it's been three weeks right it hasn't been six months so three weeks to to be able to uh, to see some some new behavior is um, I think really remarkable but there is some challenges and we're making sure that we're out and, and looking at those and, and supporting those at the same time. So I'm just approaching it as not an all or nothing. It's not eight people that have these challenges or need this support. Three or four of them may, may seem that they're more effective and more focused and there's less noise around them. So that's great. And three or four of them may, may sort of crave that one-on-one um, that -on -one or that one-on-three and we're trying to give that to them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's true there. Somebody this morning was talking about the fact that they were worried about a couple of their coworkers because they're, you know, alone in the city. They live in bachelor apartments and mm -hmm. you know, so can't even really get a change of scenery within their own workspace or, you know, home slash now workspace. And, um, but it was funny because of what was going through my mind at the time that they were kind of sharing their concern was I thought, you don't know how everybody reacts to it. And I think that is one of the challenges for managers right now is who does need more support? Who, who actually is quite happy in this new getup because they're introverts and this is their dream come true and please leave me alone. I, I actually saw a funny thing because I think a lot of us are doing, you know, more social things and I, I see a lot of companies doing these happy hours, like mm -hmm. Friday happy hours at three o'clock. And I saw this thread on Facebook where somebody said, oh, you know, really now do I have to do this virtual happy hour with these people? <laughs> like, I'm so not interested. <laughs> yeah, and I, right. Yeah. And I think, yeah. you know, we have to sort of find the, this new, like there's a new rhythm around mm -hmm. what's, what's too much. We were sort of talking as a team today that, you know, everybody's kind of swinging the pendulum so far with communication and connection and let's get connected and let's have this and let's have that and all these skip level meetings and things like that. And part of it makes you think, you know, are you inadvertently making yourself a micromanager because you're just, you're, you're basically taking what we used to do as walk-bys right in the hallway or, you know, across the table. Yeah. Yeah. And we now then turn this into Zoom meetings that we're all yeah. on, you know, 24-7. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how we recalibrate through this period. Yeah. And I think we're we're trying to pace ourselves with this there. You know, we have a regular management meeting on Monday, a team uh, staff meeting on Tuesday, uh, and then we'll do something sort of as a team on Friday. In between yeah. that, people will have conversations, you know, on FaceTime or Zoom or whatever, but I think that we're trying to understand, as you're saying, how, 
how well people work with maybe not having something in their face on a screen all the time. And mm -hmm. some, some people need some quiet to write, to get a proposal mm -hmm. out the door, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to do their 20 follow-ups that they're not able to do, maybe when there's more distractions in the office. So there is um, uh, definitely some, some positives that can come out of this, but I don't think we can group everybody as having the same experience and needing the same support. Um, uh, you know, we're looking at it as an opportunity as well to, uh, uh, to see who steps up and to yeah. see who really uh, thrives in, in this type of environment and, uh, you know, in conversations that you may be less likely to have in the office because maybe you don't work on the same teams or maybe one's a director and one's a coordinator. Uh, we're having more of those now and I think we're seeing people I'm seeing people really step up and uh, and take this opportunity to um, be more creative, to be more collaborative, uh, and to uh, to think out a little bit more than what would usually be the next thing on the list. Yeah, that's great. So the my last question for you um, that I I wanted to kind of explore with you is is this term uncertainty right? There's a lot of uncertainty going on right now. I mean from how long is this going to last for? And for many, many people, it's thinking about the long-term um, health of their businesses, their organizations, um, a lot of sort of things that are tricky. And I mean, when you're the team lead, you're dealing with that for yourself, but you're also trying to help your team, you know, manage through uncertainties and things like that. So um, how, is, how is the uncertainty affecting your team? And I guess, if at all, because, you know, you guys are a little bit unique and you've got a bit of an opportunity to pivot maybe more easily than some traditional attractions and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but how are you finding that? And what is there anything that you're doing to sort of help your team navigate through a time that's tricky for everybody? Yeah, I, I think uncertainty is is a term that can um, uh, be placed in business with the running of your organization. So there's uncertainty about, you know, we had to cancel our annual festival called Intersection. Mm, right. 12 projects, different 12 projects, different locations, more than 50 partners, um, our flagship program, right? So it is, much of it is in real life uh, at galleries or in gallery spaces at Union Station, at Stack Market and all over the city. Uh, booklets were printed, promotion was done, posters are, are out there. So there's that real um, fear and uncertainty of, well, if I'm leading intersections or I'm leading marketing on it or I've been doing a lot of work on it and now it doesn't happen, what does that mean for me? Right? right professionally in in an office as a team member of my museum of toronto there's that piece but also we don't realize in every case and we now do because i'm talking to everybody there's a different level of uncertainty about you personally how you personally are responding to the news every day and night mm -hmm. uh your family your partners your community um your loved ones your grandparents or kids and there's all kinds of levels of uncertainty that have nothing to do with my ZM that you can't just check from nine to five during the day that it, it, it is all encompassing is living with you every day it's hard to get away from so I think having these conversations about what support do you need from hey I need a headset <laughs> for my yeah, yeah. laptop but I also you know we we decided um, a couple weeks ago that take Monday off right there was a tough week it was the first week that we pivoted to being outside of the office we had just announced that our festival was being postponed we're not sure what the next steps are but we're developing them this is a lot not everybody lives with their family or their friends or their loved ones they're in different provinces or different countries so it was a lot to digest i think in the first week and yeah. so understanding that uncertainty lives on different levels having those personal conversations with everybody in confidence and allowing everybody to kind of say well this is where i'm kind of struggling i have you know my mental well-being is something that i'm concerned about and and that is you know one of the first things if not the first things that we talk about as a team like how are you doing i don't care right now about your list of to-dos but how are you mentally doing how how is your mood how is your sleep how is your separation between work and not work on a daily basis how is that going Mm -hmm. um, and where can we support that um, uh, without creating more stress and, and, uh, and anxiety on you? So 
I think as a leader of a large organization, that becomes a bigger challenge, right? Because how can you talk to 50 or 100, 200 people? I think you need to make sure that you have some uh, people that are close to you in an organization that looks after that piece of the uncertainty uh, while you're also being concerned and worried about the, your output uh, from, a, from a business standpoint. So we're trying to, to be good with that, constant reminders, and, and again, some light moments that uh, we hope will, uh, will lead to people feeling a, a little bit more comfortable in this, these uncertain times. You know what I think is, as we're talking, I mean, the, the thought that really comes up for me is that, I mean, this is just such a unique time in yeah. that collectively we are all experiencing the same thing, right? And in many ways, it's bringing the humanity back into work. You know, like we are, like to, to hear, um, you know, leaders, and I've been talking to many leaders over the last couple of weeks, and, you know, you hear people doing these check-ins, how are you? Mm. We weren't doing that, like, yeah. six months ago on a regular, right? right. you know, typically, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that this is um, really moving us away from that sort of profit, um, you know, numbers at all costs kind of mindset that we you know many of us kind of fall into mm -hmm. as leaders and it's bringing humanity back because it's a shared experience you know it's a shared experience that we're all going through so it's going to be interesting to see kind of the lasting effects on that on workplaces and on the kinds of conversations that we make time for in workplaces i think that i think that's a huge positive of the, this for all but, of us yeah i mean there's no reason why you can't continue to do that there probably was no reason why you shouldn't have been doing it before right <laughs> and right. Uh, I, so i think that to to me as a leader of an organization there is a number of different things of course your output we you know we have to uh make sure we deliver to funders mm -hmm. deliver to our stakeholders sure. deliver to our audience i have to deliver to my board yeah. um right and and those things will continue to be important what your output is what your return on investment all those things that we are concerned about as we should be um but there's another element in play here as you say and i think that to just ignore that and say that's only an issue when you're outside of the office. That's only an issue when we work from home. Mm -hmm. That's only an issue during a pandemic. Yeah. It's not realistic. <laughs> but no. If anything, you're still going to be living with some of that anxiousness when you come back to the office. It's not going to be like nobody more than five people and then everybody go back. Yeah. Right. There is going to be a, uh, an important transition period um, on the TTC getting to work. Right. Yeah being able to be in an office, standing in line at the cafe, doing all those things. So how do we, I don't know, reintegrate or, or be mindful and, and sensitive to those things once this ends, while also keeping that eye on the prize of a successful or, you know, organization and what you need to do on that front? Yeah, 100%. Well, Jeremy, thanks so much for taking the time to um, share what your experience um, with us today. And I know it's going to benefit a lot of people that are going to be watching this and listening to this because I think um, all of us are uh, trying to navigate the best we can. And so it's always great to hear how, how other people are approaching it. And you've got me thinking about a, a few things. I, I feel a few blog posts in the works here in my brain as a result so thanks for taking the time and good luck with uh, everything at myzeum and for everybody out there if you haven't checked them out this is a great opportunity sounds like there's going to be lots of uh innovation and and new ways that uh, we'll be able to connect to the work that you're doing for sure thanks so much ben great. it was a pleasure yeah great to see you see ya